Number 48, Nat and Camel. Matthew 23, verse 23 and 24. In the Sermon on the Mount, near the beginning of his ministry, Jesus pronounced eight blessings. At the end of his ministry, he uttered eight woes upon the scribes and Pharisees. Some of these severe condemnations are expressed in a form which is practically a parable in miniature. In a few lines, a picture is drawn with that power which marked all the illustrations of Jesus. The fifth woe reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Verses 23 to 24. The law required that a tenth of the seed should be contributed to God's service. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruits of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Mint, dill, and cumin were garden herbs, and the punctilious scribes and Pharisees, with what was really show-acting, were careful to insist that these were tithes before any were used. Such scrupulous care over trifles might be compared to a person sitting down to dinner and requiring that the mint used for sauce should be tithed. It was right for the Jew to tithe herbs, but the matter should be placed in right perspective in life. It was really a little thing to be done without fuss or show. But these Pharisees were particular, not because tithing was an act of obedience to God's law, but because they wished others to see how scrupulous they were in observing the details of the law. How perverted was their outlook is seen by their omission of judgment, mercy, and faith. Three essential virtues are put over against three herbs. The herbs were carefully weighed in order to assess the tithe, but the weightier matters which could not be weighed in scales were neglected by them. Their actions revealed an inverted sense of values, and Jesus calls them blind guides. How blind were they? So blind, said Jesus, that they could notice a gnat, but could not see a camel. In nine words we have conjured up in our minds a picture of a venerable Pharisee, very serious very particular about the details of his life, that all the traditions be kept. He wants a drink of water, and observes a small insect in it. Ah, that must be got out, it would cause defilement. It was a creature forbidden as food. The water is poured through a piece of linen, the gnat is strained out. He breathes a sigh of content. He has only narrowly escaped consuming the poor little thing. Pernicotiness, allied with religious fanaticism, had bred an attitude of superiority that was hateful. More than that, it had perverted his sight, for with all his fastidiousness he swallowed a camel, a hairy, dirty, verminous beast, and did not know it. It was absurd, humorously, grotesquely absurd. But so it was intended to be. Yet while so ridiculous naturally, it was distressingly true spiritually. The Pharisees strained out gnats and swallowed herds of camels. The tragedy is that, while such inconsistencies flourished in the Pharisaic mentality, the same inconsistencies reappear again and again in every age. 
it needs clear vision, developed under the instruction of Jesus to avoid this fault. The authorised version strained at is due to a misprint in the first edition that has been reproduced since. Out is in earlier translations. Strain at is a different figure altogether. Number 49, Cup and Platter. Matthew 23, verse 25 to 26. Luke 11, verse 39 to 40. The sixth of the eight woes in Matthew 23 reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Matthew 23, verse 25 to 26. This piece of hypocrisy was worse than the tithing of pot herbs. That, at any rate, was required by the law, and became reprehensible only when more important matters were ignored in its favour. But the various washings practised by the Pharisees were only based on tradition. To set these before moral duties was moral perversity. A cup or platter might to touch something unclean, and so make ceremonially unclean the food served in it. Fearful of this happening, cups and plates were washed with care. But what of the contents? Jesus wanted to know how they obtained their food. Was it by fair dealing or foul? By honest treatment of their workpeople or by exaction? By driving a bargain that took advantage of a weaker man or by just payment? How they came by the food was more important to Jesus than the chance speck of dirt which might defile the vessels that held the food. Jesus is not thinking about food in itself unclean, but as the Revised Version translates it, of vessels full from extortion and excess. If we retain the authorised version, it is a metonymy in which the principles, extortion and excess, by which a thing is obtained, are put for the things obtained. If the contents were the fruit of extortion and excess, the Pharisee was more defiled than any ceremonial uncleanness could make him. The very use of such language suggests that dishonest gain entered very much into their life, and that while careful of externals, they were morally bad within. Luke 11, verse 39. Parable number 50. Whited Sepulchres Matthew 23, verse 27 and 28 Luke 11, verse 44 The figure of sepulchres is found in both Matthew and Luke, but it is used in quite a different ways. In the Woe of Matthew 23, verse 27 and 28, we read, Ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Tombs were whitened so that any passers-by should not accidentally tread on them, and so contract a defilement. Particularly was this whitening done in spring, when the journey of many pilgrims from the north might have been rendered vain by such a contact which would have prevented the visitor taking part in the Passover service. The grave so treated looked clean and wholesome in the bright clear light, but what was inside? Dead men's bones and uncleanness. Jesus does not hesitate to say. That was a picture of the Pharisees, said Jesus, outwardly fair and clean, but within full of foulness. Did Jesus hint also that men were defiled by contact with them? In another context and on another occasion, 
Jesus used similar language to the woes of Matthew 23. He was in the house of a Pharisee who observed with dismay that Jesus had not performed the customary ablutions before the meal. Jesus charged the Pharisees with careful observance of outward things, but with neglect of the inner essentials. He used the cup and the platter and the pot-herb tithing illustrations as in the woes recorded by Matthew. But the figure of the grave carries a severer lesson. Ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Luke 11, verse 44. Men were not aware how corrupt they were, because their true character was hidden. But Jesus reveals how foul they were within, and how corrupting contact with them could be. Parable number 51, Hen and Chickens Matthew 23, verse 37 Luke 13, verse 34 There are two records of Christ's lament over Jerusalem, the one in Luke being spoken some months earlier than that recorded by Matthew. Luke's order gives an interesting context to the saying about a hen and her chickens. The Pharisees approached Jesus with the information that Herod was plotting to kill him, and that he had better leave Herod's territory. The motive of the Pharisees is not easy to determine. Some have thought the men who warned him were friendly and wished to help him. But it may be that they seized a known intention of Herod. He would fain kill Jesus, to imitate Jesus and cause him to go into Judea, where he would come under the power of the Sanhedrin. The reply of Jesus is aimed at Herod, however, from which we must conclude that Herod's intentions had not been misrepresented, and that they were known to Jesus, and also that these Pharisees had no underlying motive in speaking to Jesus, or he would have exposed them also. Go tell that fox! Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Luke 13, verse 32, 33. That fox. It puts in a word all that Herod was in character. Craftiness was a mark of the Herod family, and as Farah has said, if ever there was a man that richly deserved contempt, it was the paltry, perjured princeling, false to his religion, false to his nation, false to his friends, false to his brethren, false to his wife, to whom Jesus gave the name that fox. Luke places next the pathetic words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. His thoughts fixed on the evil rulers who had power in the land, would naturally lead him to think of the people ruled, even though they did not recognize him as their appointed king. Herod in the north, the Sadducees in the south, exercising a limited form of government. The Pharisees as the dominant influence over the people and over all pagan Rome. The strong power that swift as the eagle flieth would yet gather to destroy them. Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. How defenceless the people were, with rulers that were evil and misled by their religious guides. And yet how unresponsive to him who would guide them into truth. They were as chickens subject to depredation by foxes and eagles, and in a great yearning he wept that they knew not the day of their visitation. 
how often on his visits to the holy city he had tried to teach them, visits which are principally narrated in John and which are confirmed by this allusion. How often in a deeper sense, as he speaks the Father's words, had God pleaded with his people, but in vain. Your house. Before he had described the temple as his father's house, but it was now left to them to share their fate, was left unto you desolate. Yet it will not be desolate for ever, for the prophets tell of the coming of Messiah to the restored temple of God in the midst of a regathered Israel, when the nation which once rejected their king will acclaim him as the blessed that cometh in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, verse 26. See Parable of Cornerstone. God had said that in the day when the enemy ravaged Israel's land, as mother birds flying, so will the Lord defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. Isaiah 31, verse 5. God did this in the days of Isaiah when he defended Jerusalem. And in a day now drawing near, Jerusalem will be again delivered in a time of extremity, and Israel will find protection in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The yearning of Jesus over the city, yet to be the capital of his kingdom, reveals a phase of the travail of the man of sorrows that is sometimes overlooked.